Hello, Julian. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm, I'm really excited, actually. Yeah? Why is that? Because yeah, cause we've got we got someone coming on tonight who I know and you don't really know very well. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've been doing some Googling on our guest tonight. And, Have you? Uh, yeah, I know that she was a nominee in the UK Blogger of the Year 2019. She was, yes. Uh, she was a finalist in the Animal Star Awards Pet Blogger yeah, 2018. Yeah. She was a finalist in the Polly Birch Awards in 2018. She's in the top 75 vet YouTube channels of all time and is with her particular brand, the Innovation Award winner 2017, with her brand of hashtag Planet RVN. And it's fantastic. I don't know if you've seen them, but there's these little clips of how to how to do a, a catheter, yeah. how to uh, read a blood pressure, just amazing tips for, for RVNs and, and, and for vets, actually, yeah, who, absolutely. who are a bit embarrassed about asking their uh, RVNs how to do something. So, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome you to the next episode of Veterinary Ramblings. <laughs> Veterinary Ramblings. Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. I've got all dressed up tonight to, to, to welcome. See that? Tour de vet. That's your lycra tour de vet. This is my lycra tour de vet. I, don't, I can't remember why I'm wearing lycra. But there was uh, look, so. I've, I've, got my, I've got my homemade scrub top. Yeah, very nice too. Good colours. Yeah. Okay, so she's in the waiting room. Let's admit Jane Davidson, Planet RVN. Yay! Yay! Jo- Hello. Hello, Jane. <laughs> I'm not masked up yet. I'm not masked up. It's okay. We're social distanced, darling. Are we okay? Yeah. Yes, we're okay. Yeah. It's okay because of two reasons. One is I think we've bubbled with you, and the other reason is we're in different houses in different counties, so we're okay. Are we okay? Yeah, you'll be all right. Okay, it's a nice please. mask. Where did you get that from? <laughs> sorry, that sorry. Is, this is my Museum of English Rural Life mask. Oh, is that is that sheep? And sheep dogs all over it. Do you know why? We wear it upside down quite often, so I don't know. Uh, pigs, the, the uh, all sheep. the cows bolted, there's some chickens. Oh, there are some sheep, yes. Look at me and my large animal recognition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really wrong. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, and I thought you were just a small animal, I'll be in. No, look at me recognising common animals that you can see in a field. Yeah, yeah. but actually, I mean, I'm going to go as wild as to go. That is, oh god, I'm going to be off the camera. Frisian. Oh. Well, very cold. <laughs> but, but you, you should be able to recon- recognise all sorts of animals, shouldn't you, Jane? Because you did your training at uh, London Zoo. <laughs> yeah, but mainly, mainly the animal recognition was on lunchtime. Uh, it walking was. Walking 85 miles from the classroom to get some lunch if you hadn't brought your own. It was um, a long walk, wasn't it? There was about a 40 minute break. Although I used to try and stretch it out to an hour and a half because I, I'd go and sit with the gorillas and watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, and I just think, I I don't know about the other people, but so I went to, this was the second year of my my NVQ. Okay, so I'm doing a PhD now, but I did an NVQ for my veterinary, some of which I am incredibly proud. Um, and this was the second year of my MVQ, and I was going with uh, three other colleagues from the RSPCA. So the four of us all lived and worked in London, and I think a lot of the people that came came from outside of London. So I think they thought it was quite a novelty, you know, kind of the queuing. And obviously, we were like proper Londoners, just like, oh, God, some cute tourists. Oh, look at them trying to decide what ice cream to have. We just want food. Oh, Edward's Edward's coming to say hello. He d- oh, oh, who's that? Edward? Edward, presumably, is your cat. He's, just, he's quite a hairy man. Well, I, I was a bit worried at first, yes, when he didn't immediately say yes, of course. I thought, well, we'll move he's, forward he's, there. Right. Yeah. He is quite Edward. funny. Introduce us to Edward. Hello, Edward. Hey, Edward. You're a lover, not a fighter, aren't you? Yeah, it's, not very, it's not very talkative, is he? <laughs> <laughs> he's not wailing yet. He, he will start to. Um, this is quite funny, because he's been asleep on the chair beside me, and 
he does this whenever I'm in a video conference because he thinks that I'm talking to him. Mm. And he's like, oh, well, I must join in the chat. Yeah. Usually that involves, if I'm on my desk, it usually involves him sitting facing me, pairing, but showing his bum to the camera, which... <laughs> You, yeah. have to pretend, we, we you have to pretend he's a pencil sharpener, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> Discreetly trying to move him around. Yes, Edward Edward was, you know, Edward was my COVID baby. Oh, my COVID baby. But that, that's brilliant. And actually, and you mentioned earlier that um, uh, you, you almost embarrassedly said I did a, an MVQ, but now I'm doing a PhD. Isn't that fantastic, though, that, that, that there is this potential progression? You can do that. Uh, people sometimes say vet nursing is a bit of a dead end job, and I think it certainly used to be. But these days, there are multiple ways you can progress through it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell us about your PhD. This this PhD is actually in history of veterinary legislation, is it? Or it is. So, and it's a so this one is called a collaborative PhD. So it's the University of Kent who have a history of medicine and science department. And it's RCBS Knowledge, which is obviously the um, sort of research and charitable arm of the RCBS. So the RCBS have this massive archive, which has been bequeathed to them over the years by different vets and different organisations. And they now have a setup where they have got um, proper librarians and proper people to catalogue it. And it's now been catalogued properly to research through. So that's what this PhD is for, is actually to say, this is the information we've got and this is what we're going to do with it. Um, so what I, what I want to do with it is look at how the original veterinary legislation affects the profession today, because it does still affect the profession today. And any conversation that we have about you know, working with, with other you know, animal welfare professionals, um, mm. you know, working even, even just legislating vet nurses and what they do, you will always hear about somewhere go, mm, but Royal Charter. Actually, you're not talking about the Royal Charter. I mean, Vet Research Act of 1881, two very different things. Um, but what we do have, um, compared with human medicine, is human medicine has got physicians and surgeons and midwives and uh, pharmacists and apothecaries. And so when they originally legislated, there was a massive history of all these named people with very defined roles. And that took about 300 years for the physicians to achieve legislation. And the vets came in and went, we're doing it, we're doing it now, we're doing it in 34 years. Yeah. Or 37. It's been and, There's in a fact, let me just interject. One of the, one of the um, uh, fallouts of that was, as we were discussing with uh, the orthopaedic surgeon we had on a few weeks back, uh, this is why we get surgeons called Mr. And doctor, because there were people from very disparate groups pulled in under the uh, under the, the well, what is now the BMA, but was then the, uh, uh, the, the the doctors, apothecaries, and chirurgians uh, yeah. college. <laughs> exactly. What is interesting is the the vets made a very clear effort that they weren't going to go down the guild route, which is what surgeons came out of is that you had barber surgeons mm. and then the surgeons um, wanted to move away from cutting hair, you know, as you do. Um, <laughs> quite. Um, so then you, you had this situation where there were people that had done apprenticeships um, and became surgeons. And actually the, the way to become a, a medical professional was kind of murky and a bit, weird and and it wasn't said that you had to have a degree and the vet profession happened at just at this nugget of time where they were able to say we're not going to do that route of apprenticeships and guilds and having 20 different ways that you can become a surgeon or whatever it was you wanted to become we're actually going to make it that this is it's a degree program we start with a degree program we don't have apprenticeships this is one of my friends who's a vet and a farrier, oh, the drama. Um, I said, yeah, but, you know, if there was barber surgeons, why was there not farrier vets? And I was like, there is there's a couple of well-documented cases of people that were farrier vets, 
but there was a very definite move to not work with farriers because essentially veterinary was set up to provide healthy horses yeah that was, that was pretty much the main thing you know you wouldn't this is why people say about you know dog doctors or doctors well actually the people that were treating victorian dogs very much wanted to say we're not vets because small animals weren't in the syllabus at all mm. yeah so actually saying that you weren't a vet and you were a dog specialist was a very specific field and I mean, there's still veterinary clinics now in central London pretty much inhabiting the same building as their Victorian forefathers who treated basically Tricky Woo and Mrs. Humphrey and and their likes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the veterinary world was very, very different. And I mean, that's why BSAVA was set up in the blooming 1950s because there was no small animal forum. And that's Britain in the 1950s and 1960s. And yet when you look at veterinary now, Doing large animal or mixed practice is 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 weird and a bit of an anomaly and weird yeah. you find practices and student and you know new grad vets want to get an all round experience for a lot of them and actually finding a genuine mixed practice is really tough. But they have to do a year here, a year there, and, and yeah, I know yeah. a couple of new grads that are job sharing. They're doing uh, large animal, so one of them is doing large animal Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The other one's doing small animal Tuesday, uh, sorry Thursday, Friday, and they they swap okay. around uh, the rest of the week. Um, yeah, and I think it's yeah. sometimes you kind of need to just take. I know that there's lots of people thinking, oh well, you know, we can't always learn a lot from history. It's like yeah, but sometimes you need to look at kind of how far we've come, and the veterinary nursing journey is certainly part of that. But the vets aren't free from that at all because if you were talking about this was not until the fifties and sixties that you had. A, a recognizable small animal field, then that says to you this that was you know 60, 70 years ago. That's not actually that long ago. No, it's not. No, no it's not. <laughs> <laughs> None of us remember obviously those times, but um it's a but, mere, mere hint of time. It's a it's a whisper of time. Gone, gone. Mere well it, it is we are and I'm I'm kind of thinking of doing some oral histories with some of the vets that we've got around at the moment because we still have enough vets around at this time who have lived and worked through that transition. And, and they're the ones that, that became RCVS through grandfather rights, weren't they? There are still a few people practising who, who This are. is, yeah. Well, this is what I... Oh, man. You vets. God. <laughs> I, I... Oh, I just... I need to write a paper just on this because I don't... It will be like a paragraph in my whole thing. So literally, the first, if you look at the first paperwork for setting up the London Veterinary College, which is now the RBC, it was set up 17, 1791, kind of. Uh, eight, 81, I think, wasn't it? Was it 81? No, 91. Was it 91? Okay, I just, we, we've, got a, we've got a picture on the front wall. But again, set up as a, as a horse hospital, wasn't it? As a, as a horse hospital. But interestingly, in the initial paperwork proposing that this school be set up, um it says it's for horses and cattle and obviously defining cattle at that point would have been interesting because cattle was being used as the french chattel in terms of you know a belonging a, 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 belonging. a, life, so a livestock it, it, belonging. it would have meant any it really would have meant any livestock um yeah. and so then you've got vets were being set up but actually specifically in it the paperwork says not going to work with those farriers. They were a bit, some of them are a bit crap and a bit dubious, and we're not going to have anything to do with them. Um, and we don't want them. And then by the time we come round to creating a register for vets in 1844, we, and I still need to do the full research on this, is then we were like, uh, we'll register everyone who has graduated from a vet school, recognised vet school in the UK. And anyone who's practiced veterinary surgery continually for the last month. Uh, yeah. 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 And so it's like, oh, okay. So was that was that because there weren't enough graduates to create a profession? Because you kind of need a significant body of people doing a significant number of tasks to define or, a profession. Or was it that there's a few people who wanted to be in on it and were willing to put money in, hadn't actually done the degree? 
exactly. And also because there was significant barriers to getting that degree that they would only admit. So, I mean, to give you an idea of the difference. So in Europe, all of the vet schools were state funded. So then access was done pretty much on ability and need, whereas um, the London Veterinary College was set up pretty much as a membership club in that I would have joined as a member and then depending on how much money I paid would have said how many students I could send. So it wasn't that that me as a student would apply, it was that me as a student had to be friendly with somebody who was a member of the college. So then so slightly the setup of the London Veterinary College to begin with was actually more like the setup of what became the RCBS. And certainly the uh, the meeting minutes from uh, when the RCBS were set up uh, from the Little Bentley College were very much, oh, we thought we were running education for vets in the UK and now this body is. So, oh. so, the, so, the, so the meeting minutes were 1790 and eight, early 1800s? Yeah. Wow. Gosh, it was amazing to trawl through those. But actually, oh, it's, the, oh, it's hilarious. It's like... <laughs> It's like Karen on Facebook, but with a fountain pen. Mm. It, it genuinely is like the 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 horror, the you know the just everything like the genuine. I think people think maybe going to archives is quite dull, and actually, proper personalities leap off the page with the handwriting, with the way things are annotated, with the way things are recorded. It's just like honestly, it just makes my heart sing because the personalities that are there are brilliant. And I can see those personalities in organizations today that I can go still the same one. I, I know oh, him. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. you're a different person and I suspect that we're not related, but you genuinely have got like the same attitude and the same way of approaching things. And but it just are, if you look up um uh reports and, and, and uh, research into makeup of of committees. Then I, I can't remember who, who was it. Uh, I didn't say Mauser. Was it Mauser and someone did, did a, a report? Uh, did a, a research into the types of people who are on committees, and there are basically there's five types of committees, and almost invariably, the one you get sat next to is is the type one, which is the the person who likes to hear his own voice or her own voice. Yeah, and um, and often that's the person that writes the minutes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. And what I love is having dipped into bits with the RCBS archives is it starts off that each each meeting is like you know extensively minuted. It's pages and pages and and letters that have been put in are rewritten in the minutes so that you can see the all this. And then about 15 years later, it's three lines. Yeah. We were yeah. here. And then approval of the minutes. You go through that. And then everyone approved minutes for, for the last meeting? Uh, okay, G Gerald, yeah. What, what have you got? Uh, well, I noticed on page three, actually, you used a semicolon. I'm pretty sure that actually we use that parenthetically. Uh, I'd say a colon at the very most, but I think it's actually a parenthetical statement we put there. Uh, I'd prefer if we put it there because it actually makes a lot of difference. Yeah, right, Gerald. Yeah, yeah. All right, fine. Fair enough. Uh, oh, uh, and there's a misspelling of wanker uh, referring <laughs> to me on page nine. <laughs> that is honestly, and I just, I mean, I did, so I, before doing my. NVQ and nursing, I did history as a first degree. Yeah, um, now what, what, uh, where did you do that? At Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, went kind of straight from school, straight off to do that. Um, everyone else from my school went to do law. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're very similar. They're very similar. They're very similar. Yeah. Um, and so I just, for a lot, actually, weirdly, so for anyone listening to this and thinking, oh God, God, Jane, she's doing a PhD, blah, 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 and she writes and she does a YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what? Genuinely, for probably up until two years ago, I thought, well, Edward, can you hear Edward screaming? Yeah, we heard, I heard that. Yeah. I, 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 I was going to overlook it. I thought it was a. Yeah, we're just going to gloss over that particular. 
Yeah. Strange, strange guttural howl. No, he's he's probably about to start attacking the cafe doors and wants to go out for his nighttime spree. His nighttime spree means he sits outside the cafe doors about one foot away. He's got a great voice, hasn't he? He's hel- he's fifteen. He's slightly mental. And he, he's he has active. the sound of a potential hyperthyroid cat. Is he? Uh... He um, yeah, I believe we're on the cusp of many geriatric feline diseases. Although he had bloods about a month ago, they were all completely normal. And in oh. fact, he's been white since living with me. And so, but okay. <laughs> but he's he's now well, he's basically now caught up in the curtains by the patio door. That will silence him a little bit. Um, oh, yeah, so actually, for a long time, I thought, oh, God, I've made a mistake doing history. I should have really done English, because then I think my writing would be better and, and those kind of things. But actually, when I found the PhD on Twitter, it said, uh, you need to have a first degree in history. I was like, okay. You need to have a second level seven qualification. And I had a PG cert in clinical education because I was intending to do a PhD in clinical education, so that was the start of my master's. But then my spine was too bad to continue doing that teaching, so I had to give that up, but still did the PG cert. My top tip is, do not write master's level essays on a lot of tramadol and gabapentin. It's my life tip for you there. Um, I, I wouldn't, because uh, I get projectile vomiting on tramadol. Do you? See, I, I tramadol and gabapentin good for me for pain relief, but Good God, your brain doesn't function. Um, and then it said you'd have an interest in animals and or veterinary. So they were casting quite wide there. And, and did, did they also your name must be Jane? <laughs> and in fact, I said to uh, one of my friends that I was thinking of applying for it. And I was like, oh, God, you know, it's a PhD. And it's you know, completely outside my comfort zone now. You know, I haven't kind of done history and humanities for so long. And she actually said, if you don't apply for it, I'm going to apply for it in your name. <laughs> just, just you have to do it. So like, okay, okay, I will. Then I will. Um, so it all kind of came together. So whilst I it was a long time that I thought, oh god, I made a mistake doing history. Actually, I didn't. So I, th- I think always my kind of thing is to follow your heart because I had no idea when I was doing all these qualifications that a PhD like this would exist. Um, let alone that I would find it and that I would apply for it and I would get it. And going from a standing star, I think I found it in, where are we now? 2020. <laughs> are you sure? I don't know where I am. Um, <laughs> no, I, you're, I, you're in Whitstable. Um, Julian's in Storrington and I'm near Southampton. Yeah, Whitstable's always stuck in like 1959. But, though. but at the same time, we bubbled. We're bubbling. Yeah, we're 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 so, Did, Jane, tell me, you know, so you, you went to Glasgow to do history. It, it's a bit of a leap to become a vet nurse. It's not when you know other vet nurses. I have to say, a lot of us have made crazy leaps. But I thought you were that, implying that you were hanging around with a lot of vet nurses and just... No, no, God, no, right. absolutely not. Right. Um, I... Yeah, so I did a brief synopsis. Uh, so yeah, did history at Glasgow. Then kind of thought of the fact, I mean, I love Glasgow. So oh, maybe London's taken my heart. I was there for 20 years, but I think Glasgow's like one of the top five cities in the world. It's amazing. Glasgow's like, like London with attitude, isn't it, really? Yeah. Oh, God, it is, actually. So yeah, so then posted about in Glasgow, kind of working in bars and stuff, you know, as a history graduate does. Taught English as a second language to Japanese students in Dublin for a while. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you taught English as a second language to Glaswegians. Oh, what are we on here? Oh, actually, I'm, I'm actually Ooh, having Zaki, he's a Kirkaval, but I've got a Japanese whiskey to have later. So anyway. yeah. Oh, lovely. Very nice. We you're, you're a whiskey fan, aren't you, Jane? Uh, well, it's hard not to be yeah. when you're Scottish. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know what it yeah. was at all. <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry, we're, we're interrupting you. you you're, you're continuing. Cool. Your so, yeah, yeah. Then did that in Dublin for a while. Then went to work for Majestic Wine All right. under their graduate trainee thing back when you had to buy a case of wine, not as whatever carnation it is at the moment. So then moved to Oxford to do that. And then I think, kind of, once you're in that pool of London, it's kind of fairly normal that you get kind of dragged to London. So then moved to London for that. 
I worked for them for like four years and thank you, Edward. Um I know, but you've got a ton of food. I don't know what you want. My soul? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably, yeah, there he is a weirdo. Um and at the back of my mind was like retail is quite a grind as a job. I mean I know vet nursing vet is quite a grind, but retail is kind of just as bad in terms of the hour the hours, the pay, members of the public. Um, and at the back of my mind was always, do you know what, at school I wanted to be a bit nice. And actually at school I'd written off for and got the little purple pamphlet from the BBNA about how to uh, do bit. Those purple pamphlets, eh? Gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then I had a quandary in that I wanted to quit, um, but I still wanted to have discount on wine. So then moved in with my boyfriend and later married him, who continued to work for Majestic. And I was like, ching, we're sorted. Um, he's now not working for Majestic Wine, so I've just divorced him. Because it's like, if I'm not going to get free wine, well, yeah. or reduce the price of wine, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Wine, I can go to Aldi on my own. Yeah. But I still want to get on to why and how you became a veterinary nurse. Yeah. Or yeah. I then ask you about one of the things that you're so well known for. And that's, I think, that's certainly how I first came across you, which is Planet RVN. Yeah. But you have to tell us very quickly okay. then, Jay. Very quickly, yeah. So then while I was working for Majestic and making sure that I maintained my staff discount when I left, which was mm. clearly my number one priority, back of mind was just still, yeah, do you know what? I wanted to do this thing called vet nursing. And I actually, I looked at going to train to be a vet, mm -hmm. but I was like, do you know what? It's going to cost so much money, take so long. And actually, you just, I know it sounds like a terrible thing to say because vet nurses don't earn that much. But actually, I would have to have spent probably 150 grand to train to be a vet. And you you just aren't going to make that. And you need to do at least kind of, I think, you know, you need to do at least five years in a pretty fast paced clinic to be comfortable and competent with pretty much what clinic could face you. And at that, that time, so I was like 28, it was like, I kind of don't want to still be 40 and thinking, Oh goodness me, I'm still learning. Although I'm now 46 and doing a PhD, so clearly that idea was crap. Um, you were 25, Jane. I'm 20, mentally, I'm 25. Mentally, I'm 25. So I wrote, I got a list of all the training practices from the RCDS. I wrote 50 letters. I put in stamped address envelopes to every one of them, got 11 replies. That's One of those funny. was luckily just down the road from me in East London, and they said, come in and volunteer, because I'd said I would volunteer. So it did that for about two months, did one day a week volunteering. Then one of their student nurses left, and so I got a full-time student nurse position for three months. The clinic now is very different to what it was then, but I it wasn't that amazing in terms of its inpatient care. And I kind of thought, this is vet nursing, this isn't for me. But once I had that kind of golden three months experience, the 11 people, that had, the 10 people that had replied to me, I then wrote to them and said, hello again, uh, thank you for responding. And I now have three months experience. And then I went to work in a 24 hour clinic in Hampstead and did my training, my first year of my training there and then the second year of my training. In the RSPCA. A, RSPCA clinic. No, that was the <laughs> RSPCA clinic was where I did my second year and then stayed for five years. But the first year was um, it's village vets, vet 24. In Hampstead, oh, so yeah. celeb clients, darling, celeb. Much more my wine clientele <laughs> than the potential buckfast clientele of the RSPCA in Harmsworth. Well, not I, the, I believe, not I believe that Rob Miller be. and uh, Alan Bennett would take their uh, their pets there, wouldn't they? Yeah, I'm still contractually obliged not to tell you the celebrities' pets that I've seen. No, you can't tell me the yeah. pets. You can tell me the celebrities. That's uh, that's not covered <laughs> on. Yeah. It just is. It's it's just it's it's Bell Size Park. It's Celeb Central. Yeah. I remember somebody saying, "Oh, oh, my dog bit someone." Oh, it was Paul Weller's daughter. My dog bit, <laughs> and like that was that was the most annoying thing about it. Not that the dog had bitten someone. That it had bitten Paul Weller's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I think we'll ignore the celebrity connection there, and we'll just work on the be regression in your dog. So, yeah. you know, see, I'm, I'm hopeless with celebrities because I, we had, I was working in Wimbledon and, and we, we had a celebrity and uh, I, I won't say who it was, but um, really, really lovely guy, fantastic actor, um, the whole family act. And 
and uh, I, I saw him. I was starstruck, and I, I thought, you know, God, I, I can't believe I met him. And uh, anyway, I, I said, we, you need to bring your dog back next week for, for a checkup. And um, and his wife brought the dog in next week. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I probably made a complete fool of myself because when I saw your husband last week, I was starstruck. You know, I, I, I'm an actor, and I, I, I've been in one of the plays that he was in on, on screen. And uh, uh, she said, well, he, he'll come back next week and he'll he'll bring a, a signed photo. I said, yeah, 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 please. Yeah, thanks. So he came <laughs> back in the following week and um, we I checked his dog out very professionally. I said, yeah, all, all doing well. Doing well. And he was sort of hopping from foot to foot, quite quite chaffed. He said, um, yeah, um, 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 a, 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 anything else? I said, well, yeah, I... I spoke to your wife last week and she kind of said you might be able to give me a signed photograph. And she went, oh, here we go. Hand me this signed photograph. And I said, I'm oh, a great fan. I said, I, I, I loved that. And my mind, my went completely blank. I thought, what, what was it? Yeah. And so I said the name of a film and it was the film that his brother was in. <laughs> yes, yes. He was always very pleased with that film. <laughs> oh, no, no. I loved that. The one you were in, was, which was great also. Really, really good, which uh, will come to me in a moment. And it was fantastic. I loved it. I loved it. And you could see him sort of thinking, do I take the photo back? <laughs> <laughs> one person whose name I can say, precisely because no one knows who she is, uh, is one of the directors... Oh, everybody, everybody knows who Britney Spears is, mate. Oh, okay, fair yeah, enough. Yeah. No, no she was going to be in my bubble, but she wouldn't. But, I was Britney Spears. No, that's the conservatorship. Hashtag yeah. <laughs> Hashtag her as well. Um, so th- th- this is one of the one of the controllers of uh, of GCHQ was one of my clients, and her father bought a dog in with with spinal signs, and I said, look. Yeah, we need to operate. There's a disc protrusion here, I, I suspect. So we need to get a myelogram and we need to operate. He said, I think you need to speak to my daughter. I said, okay. He said, now, what, what, what's her number? And you can see on his phone, he was sort of dialing down. And his daughter's name came up and it said GCHQ afterwards. So I said, should, should he be showing me that? Oh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. She doesn't like me doing that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So she so passed me the phone. I said, yes. So, so yeah. uh, I, I talked to her about what was going on with the dog. And so I think we need to operate. And she said, well, is, is there a risk? And I said, well, I'm afraid there is a risk. You know, th- th- there's a risk that, that, that um, she may not regain use of her back legs. Uh, th- there's also a risk, uh, as there is in any surgery, that she may not make it through. I'm coming down, she said. I said, well, OK. Um, I need to operate pretty soon. But you know where where are you coming from? So I'm coming from Cheltenham. So well, I need to start soon because I'll be down in forty minutes. And as <laughs> <laughs> he was, and and four guys, four huge guys, swept through the practice first, black suits, made sure all was clear, and she came through. The the chopper had landed nearby. And uh, she got a, a a car that you know presumably they have stations all around. This car is met her at the, uh, the field, walked through, and she came it wasn't, through. It wasn't an Uber, is what you're saying? It wasn't an Uber. It wasn't an Uber. Yeah, okay, thank you. What's your name? Yeah, I'll take you. I'll take you. It's fine. Yeah, well, yeah, you book or whatever. Yeah, fine. And um, and I said to her, you do realise if I'm nervous, my hand will shake. <laughs> she said, don't be nervous. <laughs> okay, that, that was supposed to be a, a joke, but now I feel a bit frightened. <laughs> I have to say it was fine. Uh, well, we can tell that I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> You're still being monitored. You just don't know. <laughs> Wait, tell us, tell us about hashtag Planet RVN. Oh God, so. Yeah, I mean, they, so I started using Twitter like under my secret other username, uh, where I try and avoid the Betner world. And I very quickly realised that me moaning about, you know, the lack of Prosecco in my local Waitrose in Muswell Hill 
had one audience and then, you know, pictures of dogs' testicles had another audience. Although there are still three people that follow both counts. <laughs> There's an overlap. The police have their names, actually, and um, they're not allowed near any schools. So I started Jane RVN just as a Twitter handle. To be quite honest, if I'd thought a bit more about marketing, I should have called it like Vet Nurse Jane or something a bit more obvious. Um, but Jane RVN was that. And then quickly I kind of realised that there was quite a lot of good content out there. And the, and the way to bring it all together as a hashtag is that just... Planet RBN. And so I remember sitting one Sunday night kind of going through like, oh God, like what could we have? And again, I should have done something a bit more around the word vet nurse if one was thinking. But also at the time, the fact that we were registered veterinary nurses, you know, talking mm. 15 years, 14, 15 years ago, that the RBN aspect was really a really important thing to share. So like I started doing that and then I think it was maybe I'd been doing that about six months and I'll say this, Nigel from Vet Times. He slid into my DMs before sliding into DMs was a thing. Uh, and I, 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 actually, actually, Jane, Jane, um, sixty-five percent of our audience in America are, are American. So, if, oh, could you um, e explain a little bit more about how this gentleman slid into your? <laughs> so. They can be captured For those of you who don't know, Vet Times is the, the main, we call it a veterinary newspaper. So it does uh, publish clinical work, but it publishes a lot of news um, and it goes out to every vet clinic in the country. Um, so you can get personal copies or ones will go out and they have a lot of online content. And so what they were intending was the, the sliding into my DMs was uh, the online editor, Nigel, who'd said... Is this direct messages? Yes, direct messages. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> what did you use them for? I was thinking of Dr Martin Shoes. You know, I, was, I don't think you can ask Nigel what he does in his spare time. It wouldn't I, surprise me. I but he slid into my direct messages and just oh. said, like, Bet Times are going to do a trial of blogs for three months and we're going to pay this amount and do, would you do two blogs a month for us for three months? And... I like a lot of things in my life. I was like, I'll say yes, and I'll worry about it later. Um, and that was, in fact, I was. It's the third Thursday of the month, which is always my deadline for blogs. Um, so I was writing today, and I created my twenty twenty one folder online for my blogs for the Bet Times starting, and I started in twenty twelve. Wow! So I'm just going to share my screen quickly, just to to let some of the audience see this is this is some of your work on youtube isn't it planet, yeah. planet, mm. RVM. planet rvm so planet rvm then started as a hashtag yep. and so my blogs were going out into that i was just uh putting you know tweeting out stuff that other people were sharing and that was all really good then other people started using it as well in fact i'd like to pick up the vet times recently shared a picture of me and jack pie at rvm quite sozzled on the beach in whitstable and he tweeted out Magnum of Prosecco down with Jane RVN. And, um, you know, that was newsworthy content, apparently, that times. Wow. Yep. yep. There we go. And I was not at a flattering angle, is all I'm going to say. I was on an inflatable beach bed. I'd had a bottle of Prosecco. Well, it was not the classiest of pictures. But we had had a very good weekend of putting the vet world to rights. So then, and this is, oh, man. Right, can I just say how proud I am of this YouTube channel and this again is I know some people really get really bored going god it's Jane RBN again god she's always on about something I don't but think they do get bored I really don't I, I get bored but just to give you a synopsis of kind of my career trajectory was I really love first opinion clinic I really love anesthesia and then I started getting back problems and they got worse, and they got worse, and they got worse. And I am now classed as disabled. Um, I've had two spinal surgeries. I have a third surgery coming up later this year, hopefully to kind of sort out some muscular problems. Um, and I had to give up teaching clinical skills. And I loved teaching clinical skills. I loved teaching the OSCEs. I loved supporting students through this exam that 
is built up in their mind and by other people as this most hideous thing. And it genuinely isn't. It's 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 something that you all do every day and you can absolutely do this. And so when I was signed off work and I finally had to leave work, I signed off for over a year and then I finally left work and had to do the, do you know what? I can't teach clinical skills. I can't be in clinic. And I actually genuinely at some point thought I'd never work in the veterinary field again. And I was absolutely, I was also quite out of my face a lot of the time with gabapentin and tramadol. Um, and just generally feeling pretty crappy about everything. And I started this YouTube channel. Because I wanted to share the clinical skills that I had and my exam techniques and, and how to get through the exams and, and not stress and not panic. Um, and that's when I started the YouTube channel. And so I did it. I think I put up a video of Fortnite for about six months and just let Google do its thing. Um, so I was getting views and, and getting subscribers and things. And then I think about six months after I started it, I think I posted it. I started posting it on my social media channels and posted it to some veterinary Facebook groups. And it just went a bit mad, really. Um, Fantastic. I, I noticed here, Joan, a lot of these are, there's, there's two things I'd, I'd like to talk about here very quickly. Um, for anybody that isn't watching, but is, is listening to this, um, we're currently looking down Planet RVN on YouTube. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, I'll, I'll stop sharing there. There's all sorts of valuable information and, and clinical skills on there. But I noticed that you've hit on this format of sort of one minute to two and a half, three minute videos. What What's made you do that? I have the attention span of a gnat. Okay. <laughs> if I if if I look on YouTube and it's over a minute, it's got to be lovely good content for me to focus for more than a minute. Right. And a lot of the things that you're talking about for exam technique and for clinical skills is very short. Although we usually have these six or ten minute tasks, the the, the key nuggets of the bits that will pass and fail you are usually pretty small. Right. Um. I remember. In the early days, someone put on Facebook and went, well, I don't want to have to watch three videos to learn how to do something. And I was like, ah, because my whole point of doing these videos was never to recreate an OSCE from beginning to end, because then mm -hmm. you would just copy me. You wouldn't think your own way through it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that some people find this very frustrating, but I'm very much about student education and then finding their own path. So it's not that you mimic me or your clinical coach or anyone else, it's that you take the key components for a clinical skill and then you make them your own so that's why yeah there's there might be some that are longer but it's actually sorry my lights are all on a timer very often sorry and uh, but you're you're giving them the tools to think it through exactly yeah. and that's yeah. what and then randomly so i've been doing my youtube channel um and i do you know what i actually have such fun filming it really is like I really enjoy that medium, weirdly. Um and I can't wait. I need to build another garden office so that I've got a proper YouTube space to to mm. to do that in. Um and I yeah, I genuinely love that it. it's really good fun. Um and some of the nicest compliments that I've got is that people have met me and went, You're exactly what I thought you would be in your YouTube and your social media. And I think in an age when people try to be something different on social media, it's actually quite nice that it's like yeah, I'm not ever trying to be anyone that I'm not. This is me. And if you don't like it, absolutely walk on by, scroll on by. You don't need to partake, but I am trying to share something good. And then I got, when I was, I had a year off before getting my second spinal surgery in which I did everything to try and reduce my pain levels. Nothing worked. Um, but in that time, a publisher contacted me and said, oh, what books do you think there should be for veterinary nursing? Ah. So I gave them a list of about 20. And then mm -hmm. they came back and went, which ones would you like to write? I was like, well, I put some quite difficult titles there. I don't think I, don't think I want to write any of those. Because well, I thought they were asking me. Did you choose research and study skills for veterinary nurses? Exactly. Because that was... When I was lecturing, so you get a really limited amount of time for individual student feedback. Mm. 
in reports, you know, it's limited space, um, all those kind of things. So essentially what I wanted to do is take everything that I want to tell a student, but don't get the time or space to do it and actually then have it in a book and go here. Because one of the frustrations that I found in marking students' work was you, your ideas are good and your, and your thought process is good, but you haven't understood how this is being assessed. So then if you don't understand how you're being assessed, you can't really shine at those assessment types. And because in veterinary, you get assessed in pretty much every way there is to be assessed. Uh, you get you know multiple choice, short answer, long answer, essays, dissertations, clinical skills, vivas, the works. No one comes fully really prepared on how to win how to win all those battles. Right. And of course, the courses are so intensive that there really isn't time to then go, oh, and by the way, did you know this is how you write a multiple choice question? And this is how you pick an answer. Hmm. And so there was all these things. So essentially now, if I ever have to go back into teaching, I'll be able to go page 42. Yes. Page 28. And actually, I've, I've read your book and I must say it is fantastic. So it's research and study skills for veterinary nurses, a practical guide for academic success. Uh, Available on Amazon, several five star reviews. I've read, I haven't read all of it, I must admit, but I've read about half of it uh, and I love it. Really, really easy style. I love the fact that you've got these so called exam hooks. So you start off at the beginning, uh, going into the mental health aspects of, of exam nerves and, and, and fears and worries. Um, and that's clearly quite a, quite a big topic for you and quite a big concern for you that people do get worried. They do get very concerned about uh, about exams. Uh, we we'll maybe touch on that a bit later. But what I found really interesting, because I'll, I'll, I have, I, I guess, a uh, weird uh, memory in, in, in many ways. It's my didactic memory. Um, but you, so, so I've never really thought about the ways I learned. I just either learn or don't. But you go into ways of learning and, and the several models of learning. But you also have this thing called the one minute paper for for note taking in lectures. Yeah. Um, now a one minute paper, that, that could, what I, what I'd like to do is, is two things. What I'd like to do is very, very briefly ask you about this one minute paper. And then I think I'm gonna pass you over to Mike, who who, who has something else that he might like you to do in a minute. But oh, no. <laughs> and, and uh, listeners. No, this isn't really. Can, can you tell us about the one minute paper that, that you mentioned? So, the one minute paper is actually something that's used in teaching. And the so the idea behind it is uh, we learn by repetition and, and improving our recall. So, the idea, my, my whole theory is that before you put your notes away and go, oh, but I'll get to that when it's exam week. You probably want to have looked at your notes or interacted with them three to four times. And one of the ways that you would do that as a lecturer is at the end of a session, you would ask students to create a one minute paper. And the idea is that they'll answer two or three questions that are reflective about what they've just learned. So A, they've already learned something new in that lesson. B, they're getting their second kind of bite of those three or four recall sessions in your session. But as a lecturer, then you can go, hmm, I do think that's what I was teaching, but good to know. Um, and the way that I like to use it for people when they're studying is, and I even see this with um, some MA students that I'm mentoring at the moment, is that they'll describe their study time in, I'll do six hours of study today. So, so what does six hours mean? You're going to do six hours of reading. You're going to do six hours of note taking. If, if I say to somebody, what are you doing? And they say, I'm making notes. That's really passive learning. You're making notes to read again in the future, but you're not actually reading them and, and, and doing anything active with them at that point. So I always think the idea for me as a one minute paper is, you know, read notes for 20 minutes or make notes for 20 minutes and then stop and ask yourself, what have I just learned? What am I doing? How does it link with what is going on? And is there anything I don't know when I recall that I need to, you know, maybe link to something else? And so it's it's one minute paper. If you Google it, you'll find a template for it. Or there's a handy template to download from my book. 
Um, There's a very handy template in a sort of quadrant format, isn't there? Yeah. Which is, which is really and interesting. It's quite, yeah, and I've done quite a few templates to download because then you can tailor them to what you need because everybody's different. Yeah. But yeah, I like the one minute paper as in it's meant to be used for, for teaching purposes. But actually, I think it's a really good way if you, I find it good for vet nurses in terms of getting them to focus on not going off and spiraling into lots of other things. And I find it particularly good for vet students because vet students will take one tiny learning outcome and go and study it for three hours. When it was one learning outcome of five from a one hour lecture, so actually three hours on that isn't great. So it's a way of then curtailing our very much academic minded, you know, detail focused vet students to pull back and go, if I can answer these three questions and what I've just learned, that is enough for now and I am good enough and I do not need to go and start with a learning outcome here and have read all the way around it and ended up here. And then when my assessment is based on this learning outcome, they not understand it because I've gone way somewhere else. And so that's the idea of the one minute paper. And it genuinely is then a minute. You know, it's a minute of what can I recall? What does it mean to me? Where is this going to lead to me? Okay, yeah. Wait. I, th I think I missed it out from the rules, but we, we've got a feature on the show that we call One Minute CPD. Oh! <laughs> well, I've just done it. Well, yes, indeed. Ah, ah, ah. But oh, there is a catch. Oh, there is a catch. Oh, no. so, 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 Jane, would you would you care to take on our One Minute CPD challenge? To what perhaps. What is my prize? To perhaps. Uh, there is a glass of wine for you at the next Veterinary Congress in Manchester, 2021. Yes. <laughs> 2022 is going to be virtual in 2021. Yeah, I know. It's a virtual oh, no. point. I knew what I was saying. So what would, you, what would you like to cover on One Minute CPD then, Jane? As it's timed, I'm going to talk about using time effectively. Using Ooh. time effectively. Okay, that's yeah. a good challenge. It's, it's a challenge. It's a bit of fun. Um, but what we found is that you know, sometimes some good stuff can come out of that. Yep. So, so Jane Davidson on one minute CPD, using time effectively, your time starts now. So in my lovely book, I talk about that timing yourself when you're reading, writing or doing your OSCEs is about having a time challenge, not having a time limit. We should not be scared of the amount of time it takes us to achieve certain things because whenever we're learning, we start off not knowing how to do something and we improve our skills and improve our knowledge and with that, improve the time it takes us to do things. So being the fastest isn't always being the best, but being competent and safe and doing it in a reasonable length of time is fine. So one of the things I always like to say to people is, Time yourself, but don't be scared if you don't achieve in the time when you set out using that for OSCEs, one minute papers, or anything else that you do. Time is still your friend, but just be aware of the time that you're spending on things, and then you won't waste time. Wow, I'm blown away. Jane, how fabulous was that? You brought that in at one that, minute. That was amazing. That was okay. fantastic. Manchester 2022, I'm buying you a glass of wine. <laughs> if we get, oh no, we will get there. We must be positive. We will get there. We will get there. That was absolutely fantastic. That, that was great. Yeah, was I, d work. I genuinely think lots of people really worry about their OSCEs and they're yeah. scared to time themselves because they know that going over time is failing. But the only way that you get to know if you're going over time is if you time yourself. So it's about not being scared. I feel at this time, we, 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 we've spoken about... Um, about reflection and it was quite important actually because because actually this brings us down to to what we've learned tonight because i think we've covered a huge amount of things that would class in in anyone's books as as cpd yep. and and i happen to have a, a certificate to prove that we've done that Yay! here we go so uh -oh. tell us talk us through the certificate then julian it says, well i never that here's another it's another certificate from those <laughs> Really nice veterinary ramblings, guys. My goodness, we must have learned lots tonight. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Easy, and it's me and him. And look, here we go. This is this is again uh, 
there's always a meaning to these things, although it's uh, somewhat unclear. This is a reflection of a tree. Oh, lovely. We're learning, so we're reflective hard on that mm. tree learning. And it shows that sometimes we may take the wrong path, just as this car here who's gone, uh, gone mm. astray on, on, this, uh, on this mountain. The wrong path is, is it's never the wrong path. It's well, just the path that you're on. Absolutely, it's never the wrong path because actually your your mind will fly to the right answer and to a new way of learning. That's a red kite, I think. It was a yeah. red kite, yeah. 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 That, that was flying above my house yesterday. Oh, nice. What was it hunting? Small children? Pro or uh, Probably me. <laughs> probably me. I'd passed out on the lawn for about two hours. Uh, I woke up to find it had grabbed hold of my little toe and was uh, was carrying me. Uh, it was a, Is that a euphemism? An emotional time. Right. <laughs> was it really? Really? Oh my god. But but but, 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 but we so can't bad. use we can't use that C B D certificate, can we? Not 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 directly as that. Yeah. Because, of course, as we've covered this evening, thank you very much indeed, Jane, and, and as the certificate there mentioned, we are, of course, required to reflect on the learning points in our fabulous one-minute CPD and our one-minute exams and all of the learning materials. So if, uh, if we could invite you, Jane, to join us on a moment's reflection so that this will qualify as CPD to the RCBS. Edward, reflecting. Shh. We're trying to reflect here. Come on, Jake. Trying to reflect. I thought you'd been in archives and, and libraries and things. I must clean that blind tomorrow. Yeah. Right. I, I, have, I have to say, Jade. Right? I have to say you, you, you've alluded several times to um, to the various things that have been going on in your life over the last year. Um. And I really have to say that, that you are an absolute inspiration because each of those things that you've mentioned, divorce, PhD, moving, moving house. house, changing jobs, each of these things carries a huge stress level to them. Um, I don't honestly know why you're not in a street jacket writing your name in large letters with a crayon in your feet at the moment. Is that not. what a PhD is? <laughs> pretty, pretty much, pretty much. But I, I think, um, however you may be feeling, and I hope it's as good as you sound, you are a huge inspiration to anyone who may be listening tonight. And for that, I thank you so much. Mm, thank you really. Much. Well, thank you. But uh, do you know what? I have a very, very good friend network. And I think mm -hmm. you know, there's just, there have been some really lovely people who, Actually, some of them are people that, you know, I, I meet at conferences and, you know, sometimes these can be kind of superficial friends and they have been phoning and checking in and, you know, just generally, you know, I, I think you kind of see who your true friends are when, mm. you know, stuff gets hard. And also, I I think I'm I'm always very much a kind of glass half full person or preferably totally full if it's a glass of wine. Uh, but you, you mentioned... Um... You mentioned glass half full, and that that struck me that, that actually oh, glass that, glass um, glass is pretty much where we are on on, on, uh, on this podcast, and it reminded me of the the African king who, rather than rather than glass. Was interested in grass because he lived in a, a grass hut and his his hut was, was made of, of this sisal uh, very fibrous grass and, and uh, because it because it's very fibrous it was able to to withstand a, a lot of tension a lot of pressure so uh, the the grass houses in his part of africa were, were two or even three stories high and so he made this palace essentially where all the other tribe leaders were making single-story huts. He made this palace with, with three stories. 
And he thought, well, I've got three stories here. I don't really need them. I've got all these rumours that don't need. Uh, I need a collection because that's what I've seen Western people have. They have a collection they fill their, their grass houses with. And I'm a tribe leader. Uh, what do I do? What do I do? I, I sit on a throne. I, I dictate my policies from a throne. And I rather like the throne they have at the, at the village down the road. So um, uh, I said, if I can buy that. And he bought it and he thought, this is a fantastic throne, this. But actually, I'd quite like the throne they got, actually, about 30 miles down the road in the next village. I might as well buy that. And it got to be a thing with him. And he got all these different thrones. And he'd, he'd spend a week or two sitting on one thinking, this is the best throne to have. But then he got bored with it. He thought, well, it's not good enough. I, I need to have something better. I need to have something that really shows that I am the leader, not just a leader, but the leader. So he, he'd, he'd store the, these old thrones up on the second or third floor of his, of his sisal grass hut. And he got to the stage, there were about 40 or 50 of him, and he got one more. He thought that there, there's, there's a, a tribe about 50 miles down the road. I'm going to get their throne. And he bought it back and thought, wow. This is absolutely <laughs> all the thrones stored in the upper floors fell on him, collapsed, killed him. Poor chap. And it just goes to show that people who live in grass houses shouldn't stow thrones. It was as physically painful as I thought it would be. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't humour him, Jay. Don't don't humour him by laughing, please. I know, but you know, sometimes you have to help the needy, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's and care it, in the community, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember cool. anything that Julian. I don't remember anything that Julian ever lectured to me about, apart from his Strider joke. <laughs> um, and I was the only one that laughed in a group. You were. Of <laughs> No one else got the Lord of the Rings joke. And I, I was laughing. I mean, just there was a sea of faces. And you know when you think, have I got this wrong? <laughs> like, am I laughing at something that isn't actually meant to be funny? But I was like, no, but it's Strider. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. It suddenly struck me. I was talking about I was, I was doing a, a, a on them. 25 um, people that, like, had none of you, none of you, Read Lord of the Rings. That was my overriding memory of being told by you. It was just me going, no. <laughs> it's, it's, I was doing this, this, this lecture on, on respiratory diseases, and I kept on talking about Strider. I said, Dem- <laughs> Strider is it, 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 really. Strider sounds like a character from Lord of the Rings, doesn't he? I'm Strider. We're off to meet Mordor. <laughs> There'll be murder and Mordor is Strider. And. <laughs> I was I was pissing myself with laughter, and and there was this one person at the back who was giggling away. It was Jane, and the others were going. Okay, let's try it again. It was it. a genuine like tumbleweed moment. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We we but for regular listeners of the show, we get those every, every yeah. time. Yeah. There we go. On that note. <laughs> on that note. Can I say on that bombshell? On that bombshell. Could I say? Jane, hashtag Planet RVN. Jane Davidson, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us this evening and sharing some of your stories and your learning tips. And uh, if anybody's actually enjoyed listening to this episode, don't forget to click like, share, spread the news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, podcasts. You can download the podcast as an audio only if you wanted to. So, Jay Davison, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me, boys. You're very, very welcome. May, 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 your, may your dog go with, with you. you. May <laughs> your dog go with you too. Cheers. Take care. Take care. Bye. And cut. <laughs> Yay. <laughs>